Ezekiel here from GuffetStuff.net. Today we're going to be looking at some of the arcade cabinets featured at the Game on Expo in Mesa, Arizona. Most of these cabinets were provided by Cobra Bar, the Bonus Round, the Grid, Starships, and even Castles and Coasters. So let's begin! So the first game we're going to be showcasing is Bubble Bobble, made in 1986 by Taito. I believe it was provided by Starships. It's a simple little game in which you're a tiny little dragon that shoots bubbles. And what you do is just entrap, like, I guess, little demon guys. It's hard to explain what the hell they are. And, yeah, it's pretty much it. It's a hundred levels of just doing that. And one of the things that kind of sucks about it is the fact that unless you have a second player uh, playing along in, alongside you, um, there is no continues. So if you're single player, three lives or how many how many extra lives you have, you're pretty much screwed, and you only get one continue. And it goes as far as to mock you by showing you how far you went and how far you, away you were from reaching the last level. I gotta say it's it's an addictive little game, even though it's horrendously simple. The arcade uh, cabinet that we were playing it on at Game On Expo was actually in pretty good shape, uh, I must admit. So yeah, Bubble Bobble, uh, if you ever have the chance of playing it, I suggest you do. Even though it's probably not the most intricate of video games. But regardless, you could probably play it on NES, you can play it on even on a uh, Taito Legends compilation game, which is on PS2. Next up, we have the game that pretty much put Nintendo on the map. Donkey Kong made in 1981 is a very frustrating yet, I guess, satisfying, depending on who you ask. Um, one thing I learned playing this is that, well, unless you've been playing it for, I don't know, days prior, you're going to get your ass kicked. It took me a while to actually beat the first level and a few continues to accomplish that Herculean feat, it seems. And it pretty much takes you to the last level, the first playthrough, so you only play two levels. And the second level is not too bad, unless, of course, you get stuck in a corner by the little flame guys. And then after you beat that, you give Donkey Kong a concussion, comes back for revenge, and then you play it all over again. And except this time, it adds an extra level. So, Donkey Kong, it's... It's a classic. I mean, what can I say? It The cabinet itself, it still looks pretty good, I must say. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a timeless classic. You know, it's something that you play, you know, if you want to look back at how Nintendo pretty much got their star in the world of video games. And it involved a monkey and a plumber and some random woman being kidnapped by said monkey. And fun fact... Originally, it was called Monkey Kong, but for some reason, somebody mispronounced it as Donkey Kong, and it kind of just stuck. So Donkey Kong became history. So that's your little fun fact for Donkey Kong. Here is a cabinet that was provided by Cobra Bar. It is 1985's Ghosts and Goblins, made by Capcom and under license by Taito of America. And this is easily one of the most frustrating video games I've ever played. Although, the, the big irony of me saying that was the fact that it was perhaps the first game I have ever played. I've, I may have mentioned that before, but regardless, Ghosts and Goblins on the arcade... There really isn't much difference between um, the arcade and the NES version, of course, outside of the graphics. It's just as frustrating, it's just as fun, I must say. And the cabinet itself, um, actually the cool thing about Cobra Bar, and y and when you go to Cobra Bar, you're going to notice this immediately, is that it uses they have original artwork, and according to the owner of Cobra Bar, all the artwork is done by their friends, so a lot of local artists uh, decided to work on the cabinets because some of them were either a, you know, he didn't like the way they looked, or he just wanted to add a little spice to the cabinets. I mean, everything, you know, it controls fluidly still. It plays good as new, even though I only got like half of the second level through, because again, this game is absolute horror. It really is. 
And uh, I'm not gonna lie, when I was four years old, this game actually made me shit myself. Not literally, but figuratively, of course, because, you know, I was probably, again, four years old. Why would I do that? But anyways, Ghosts and Goblins. If you ever get the chance, if you're if you feel very masochistic, go ahead and check it out. It's good shit. Major Havoc, even though this game came out in 1983, it's made by Atari. I believe Starships once again provided the cabinet. And I got to say, for a vector graphic game, it's uh, it's quite impressive. It actually pushes the limits in terms of vector graphics to where it can create, you know, scaling and some sort of pseudo 3D environments, um, especially during the space battle section of the game. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty much like two and a half games in one. You got the space section, and then you have to land the ship in the white line, and then you have to, as your little astronaut guy, you just go ahead and. Uh, and uh, do something to the reactor. I'm pretty sure you just plant a bomb or something, and then you get out of the ship, you get out of the space station, excuse me, and you get into your ship and you fly away. Some of the graphic effects in this game, just it, they're just good times to be had, I mean. I mean, it's just fun to see it. And in terms of the difficulty, the one thing I must say is that the dialer uh, on the cabinet itself, it's still pretty functional, I guess. Um, I did have a little bit of trouble um, moving it, especially if I wanted to move very fast. So it usually takes the little astronaut guy a while when you're inside the space station to respond if you want to move fast. But other than that, I mean, it just it just responds very well. And, uh, you know, there are some parts that are total BS. But other than that, it's... Um, it's quite fun, and again, you know, it's just, it's just a it's quite a sight to see, even though for it's a game that has very primitive graphics and was released in 1983. So, I'm pretty sure Major Havoc is next to impossible to find. If you live in Mesa, go ahead check out check it out at Starships. Next, we have something quite interesting: Narc, made in 1988 by Williams or Midway, whatever you want to call them. It's um. It's odd. It's a side-scrolling shooter in which you bust criminals and drug dealers, and it's all about just taking down drug dealers. That's basically the gist of the game. Who shoot at you and throw needles at you, which I'll get to in a ma matter of seconds. Attention, one. Oh no, the knife, man! Five, one, one, in progress. Let's go! And you play a guy who wear, who wears a sleeveless jacket and leather pants. He's all blue and he's wearing a motorcycle helmet. He's got a rocket launcher in one hand and an, and an MP5 in the other. And you just go around, start mowing down drug dealers like you're a Filipino president. And it's quite fun, even though, again, it's basically a coin guzzler. Seriously, most of these games are just... I mean, that's the nature of arcade games. They're just designed to take as much coins out of you as possible. So they rev up the difficulty in every single way. And one of the ways that Narc does it is by throwing as many enemies at you as possible. It tries to overwhelm you, and that's pretty much the nature of midway arcade games. They like to have fun, but also they like to throw in a little monkey wrench here and there. So Narc is no different. It's over the top. It's ridiculous. It's good times. So, yeah, NARC. Check it out. And we now have Rolling Thunder 1986, made by Namco. And if there was one game I wish I didn't play, this would be it. Rolling Thunder is basically what you get if you mixed um, elevator action and take away all the fun that elevator action provides. Uh, the main character is some Lupin the Third looking guy, very lanky, he's wearing a sweatshirt. I know Lupin the Third never wore a sweatshirt, he wore a suit. But anyways, you're just shooting down hooded villains and their Technicolor uniforms. And that's all I really got to say about it. Outside of the fact that this game was very frustrating. For an arcade game, you wouldn't think it would be too frustrating. Because even though I did say earlier that they're hard, at least they're not annoyingly hard. This one, though, it is. Apparently Namco couldn't decide uh, how much damage a bullet would do, so you better pray that, that getting hit by a bullet only takes half your health, because 
Every time I try to play try to play this, it seems as though it just have trouble deciding. So I get hit with one bullet, I'll take I lose half my health, but then like 60% of the other bullets I get hit by, all my health goes down and I die instantly. It's 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 just annoying. I went to touch Rolling Thunder again and I I don't understand the appeal. It's quite boring to be perfectly honest. I mean, you look at Rolling Thunder and it just looks it's just it looks sad. It's a sad little arcade cabinet, but then again, what can you do? It's Rolling Thunder. I I don't know where else you would be able to play it, but I suggest no, don't do it. Just don't no. <laughs> So here's a little interesting fighting game, SNK versus Capcom, or SVC Chaos. I mean, I know a lot of people have no love for it, but for some reason I'm just drawn in. I think it's just because of the way it looks, and you know, it's SNK making this fighting game in the same light as, uh, you know, Street Fighter or whatever, because most of their, you know, a lot of their uh, uh, earlier games, they were team-based, and you know, they had, you know, a lot more grounded characters, but when you add in like characters like Ryu, even like uh, uh, Zero from Mega Man X, uh, it kind of makes things a little bit more interesting. The way it works is that you basically have like two health bars, and health goes down rather quickly. But the thing is, is that it's just your basic run-of-the-mill fighting game. And when your health is in the red, uh, you actually have like some desperation move. It's sort of like uh, what Street Fighter Four did, which is. Something I honestly never liked, but regardless, it's it's passable, you know. And and I'll admit that it's not the best fighting game in the world. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't, I would have I would have trouble saying that it's even a good one. But for some reason, I'm still drawn in. I think it's just because of the graphics and you know what, some of the a little bit of the gameplay, um, some of the elements that they brought in. You know, it's still very fluid. It's still fun, despite its shortcomings. SNK versus Capcom SVC Chaos. Uh, 2003 SNK Playmore. I believe it was one of their last uh, games that they've created before SNK kind of went under and the Neo Geo did as well. So this is one of the last Neo Geo games that you can play. I'm pretty sure you can find a cartridge of SVC Chaos. Even though it was made in 2003 and for all intents and purposes, Neo Geo was a 90s console. So SVC Chaos. Check it out if you can. Space Harrier Sega 1985. It's a weird game, to say the least. It's a, I like to think of it as a surreal shooter. You play as a guy who floats around, and there's some weird stuff flying at you, like some Easter Island heads, some undescribable things, flying robots, dragons that shoot meteors at you. For, for a game released in 1985, here's the thing with Sega. I've always felt that Sega was king of the arcades. And with Space Harrier, I think that still holds true. Uh, provided by Cobra Bar, and still in very good tip-top shape. I think it's, I believe it was, a, it's in its original artwork and cabinet or whatever you want to call the setup. But you pretty much control your guy with a joystick, and you have like three different buttons you can push to make him shoot. And you pretty much shoot as... He pretty much shoots as fast as he can push whichever button you want to push. And you just float around. And one of the weird things about the game is that uh, even though you are actually delivering damage, the bullets still ricochet off the off the enemy. I don't know how that... I don't know why they did that. Basically, in order to figure out that you're killing somebody is that they change color. Just like with most arcade games. But Space Harrier, it's very weird. It's very fun, though. I mean, if there's any criticism I might have is... Well... The obstacles on the ground, for some levels, you can just pretty much zip through them. He'll just start tumbling on himself. But in some levels, if you crash on the, if you hit something on the ground, then you die instantly, and it's that's kind of BS. A lot of things you can crash into and die instantly, even though you pretty much have like no time to react, because in most of the levels, you just assume you could just shoot down everything. But then it gets to the point where you can't do that, so you kind of have to maneuver your way through pillars and all kinds of weird stuff but space harrier very imaginative very fun to play and uh yeah space harrier sega tapper 1983 made by midway and as you can tell there's a giant product placement uh, on the background there the point of the game it goes like this you're a bartender you have four cap you have four stools i guess you have to 
you have to tend to. And you see a guy come in, and you get your beer. You, you, I believe, if I remember correctly, you hold down on the joystick. There's a little joystick that's supposed to be like a tap. So you hold it down until the beer, you know, fills up the mug, and you slide it towards the uh, customer, and they fly uh, into the door. Basically, the point of the game is to make sure that all the patrons go through that door. I must say, again, because it's midway, they're going to throw a lot of BS at you. There's so many ways you can lose in this game. If you don't catch uh, the mug, the empty mug after the finished drinking it, you lose. If the uh, patron gets to you before you can satisfy their needs, you lose. And there's a bunch of other ways you can lose. I just can't remember. But, you know, it was a very short time that I uh, had playing Tapper. And, uh, again, you know, you're serving Budweiser. And... Um, I believe because, I guess, parents were complaining or something. Uh, they removed the Budweiser product placement, and they just made it plain old root beer tapper, which is safer for the kitties, I guess. So you just serve root beer, and you just throw it at customers until they all go, they all leave the bar. And uh, after that, you get to see your little bartender have a poor one for himself. So that's a charming little game. I, I do like the little graphics. They are, they are actually a little, you know, quite detailed and quite colorful for a game in 1983. Uh, but Tapper, Root Beer Tapper, whatever you want to call it, good shit. <laughs> The next one out of all the arcade games, I'm pretty sure this one gave me the biggest nostalgia trip. The Simpsons Arcade Game. Made by Konami in 1991, and let me just start off by saying... Early 90s, Konami was on fire on both arcade and in home console. Um, you had games like Turtles in Time, you had Sunset Riders. All these games were coming out. Konami was just shooting them out left and right. And The Simpsons was probably one of their more defining beat em ups during the time. And uh, it's very colorful, very vibrant. Uh, what's really cool is the fact that you have original voice. Uh, clips by the voice actors themselves in this game and basically the mission is to rescue Maggie from Smithers because she has a diamond as a pacifier so they decide to take the whole baby and um, and since you know player one by default is Marge that's pretty much who I played as I also played a little bit as Bart as well and what's cool is that um, they introduced the idea of if you have multiple players um, there is a chance that you can actually get two of the characters to do some sort of uh, special attack, and it basically is like a, a, a room clearer. Um, it's kind of it's kind of tricky to do, but if you get it right, it's actually very satisfying. Um, the there the cabinet itself um, there actually is original artwork, and it's actually very well done. I must add, um, very uh, very interesting colors on the sides and. Simpsons Arcade, I mean, that was a, probably one of the first arcade games I've ever played. It's very fun stuff, and it's very cool. Um, very action-packed, very colorful, full of life, um, I, I must say. You can pretty much grab every, anything you see, and you just throw it at your enemies. It's, it's a very satisfying beat-em-up. So, if you ever get the chance, I do believe it's on Xbox Live Arcade right now. So, go ahead and check it out, uh, the Simpsons Arcade game. Next, we have what amounts to a mess of colors and sound and just Atari weirdness. Uh, made in 1990, Thunder Jaws. You play as a spy and there's some chick that you have to, like, get rid of or something like that. It's very weird. There's a lot of weird things going on. And uh, outside of the weirdness, it's, it's kind of an eyesore. The graphics, the colors just look very, just... It looks like pastel smudged together it's very smudgy if that's even a word just nothing looks appealing at all you look at the backgrounds and it's just bleh, but the, it's like the only thing that looks even remotely remotely nice is the title screen where it's like your guy is like about to face a shark and it looks pretty lifelike and you have the seizure inducing thunder jaws title screen and the, it involves two parts each level you got the swimming section which is kind of fluid i guess 
The thing that sucks though is that there's no invincibility time every time you get hit. So if you get stuck in a corner and there's like there's a shark or there's a bunch of bullets flying at you and, and you can't get out of the way, you're gonna get hit by all those bullets or that shark is just gonna bite you until you die. It's kind of dumb, but I mean, it's if you could tolerate like horrible sound design and just weird, ugly, ugly, ugly graphics, then I mean, you can I guess you can tolerate Thunder Jaws. But the second section, when you're out of the water, it's very sluggish. Although I had a pretty good time for some reason. It's very odd to ex it's very hard to explain. Anyways, the cabinet itself, I do believe it was provided by uh, the grid, actually. Um, but anyways, Thunder Jaws, meh. Ultimately, it's again. I did have a little bit of fun, but I mean, I only had it for so long until I realized that my eyes were bleeding from what I was looking at. But anyways, Thunder Jaws, it's meh. Finally, uh, we actually have probably one of the cooler uh, restorations we've ever s I've ever seen on an arcade cabinet, uh, Tron, which is a classic. Uh, video game. I do believe Disney had a hand at it, but it was primarily designed by Midway. Released in 1982, it's considered an all-time classic. And uh, it it really is. Um, you get to play four different games. Uh, you have a little light cycle game, which is kind of like a dual version of uh, Snake. So basically, you have to get the enemy uh, light cycle to crash into your beam of light, of course. And then you have um, a tank game pretty much it's basically just like any other tank game where it's like a top down and you move you move the uh little gun and then you just shoot but the cool thing is, is that it like ri the bullet ricochets so it's like you can actually time it very perfectly and that's usually how i beat it this game is not easy at all um it's all about timing it's all about you know just calculating everything correctly and um Cobra Bar did a very good job in restoring the uh, uh, the cabinet. As a matter of fact, you actually see that the game was designed by the protagonist of Tron on top. Very luminescent, very cool. Um, hopefully, if you ever go by there, you can check out the uh, cabinet. It's very cool. So, in conclusion, the arcade cabinets that we did see, you know, it was good times to be had. Um, of course, there were a few that we missed, a few noteworthy uh, arcade machines, but the thing was, was that we never really had the chance to play them. Uh, there was a Street Fighter V cabinet, believe it or not, and uh, there was something called Killer Queen, which was an indie game, and it was packed, like seriously, everybody was on that. Uh, I, hadn't, I still have no idea what it's all about, but it's, it's very cool to see that arcades are making a comeback. As a matter of fact, there's an arcade, uh, there's a, just a plain Jane arcade, it's not even a bar, um, that opened up in Tempe. Um, so we're definitely going to go check that out. Um, but until then, this is uh, Ezekiel for GuffinStuff.net. You guys take care. GuffinStuff.net!